Okay, so a little bit of this is review which you did right, you know, when we were doing the first one where we did cells form tissues, tissues form organs, organs form um, organism. So there are four basic tissues. Tissues are formed, up, formed by cells which perform similar cells which perform a similar function. So all epithelial cells, for example, will form epithelial tissue. So these are the four basic types of tissue. And there are three germ layers which are present in our body. They are ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. If you look at a fetus from the outside, so if I draw a fetus like this, and you know, this is where the eye is, this is where the limbs will form, a little fetus. Ectoderm is on the outside. So if you remember this way, it's on the outside, so it will give rise to skin, like the epidermis of skin. Uh, not muscles. Uh, ec ectoderm, outside, gives rise to epidermis. Endoderm is on the inside. So from here, if I draw the mouth and, you know, the digestive tract and so on, so it's inside. The inner lining is formed by endoderm. So this on the outside is ectoderm, on the inside, the inner lining so the epithelium of the gastrointestinal tract, the um, epithelium of the genitourinary tract, that's again endoderm. And in between, this area in between is mesoderm. So mesoderm usually gives rise to the in-between tissue like muscle, bone, connective tissue that comes from mesoderm. Some mesoderm gives rise to epithelial tissue also. Some glands are formed from mesoderm. So that's why we see epithelial tissue arising from all three germ layers. Connective tissue is from mesoderm. Muscle is from mesoderm. Nervous tissue is from ectoderm because the ectoderm, this outer layer, actually dips inside and forms the brain and spinal cord. So nervous tissue is from ectoderm. It's called neuroectoderm. Let's look at epithelial tissue. It forms the lining on the outside. It lines the outside of our body like the epidermis of the skin or lines the inside of cavities of certain organs or body cavities. We'll see which ones. The cells are very closely packed, so they tend to form continuous sheets. So it's very, very, you know, it's not only located in small areas. Large areas are covered. The cells invariably sit on a basement membrane. So if we have cells, they are sitting on a membrane. This is the basement membrane, part of which is secreted by the cells and part of which is secreted by the connective tissue underneath. So this is connective tissue underneath. So this basement membrane is formed by cells, part of the cells themselves secrete part of the basement membrane and the connective tissue also secretes most of the basement membrane. It has a free upper surface. If you notice this free surf on the top, the apical surface is free, the bottom is attached to the basement membrane. This is very typical of epithelium. So if you look at skin, for example, so if you take a person like this, right, and this is the inside like a tube. Now here, the skin, the many layers of the skin which we'll see. So one surface is free and then the lowermost layer is sitting on a basement membrane. If you take a tube inside, let's say, say you take the esophagus. So I draw the esophagus like this and say this is the esophageal wall. Okay, so here, if this is the basement membrane, the esophagus also has multi-layered epithelium. One part is free, one part is sitting on the basement membrane. Okay, so the apical surface is free. So imagine if I drew a tube like this, if I made a, fashioned the tube this way, and this is the lining of the tube, the topmost cells will face the lumen, right? So they'll be free. The bottom will sit on the basement membrane. Epithelium is avascular. It is without blood vessels. 
but it has a very, very good nerve supply. It undergoes rapid cell division, epithelial tissue in many parts of the body. Remember we talked about it, that was one area where you have rapid cell division. As I said, it forms the lining of or many organs which have a hollow cavity like the esophagus, the stomach, the duodenum, the small intestine, the fallopian tube forms the lining. And it also forms in many parts, it forms what is called glandular epithelium. So let's say if I take, if this is the stomach and I take a small part of the stomach and I'm just showing you a small part. So this is the wall of the stomach and here's the epithelium. The epithelium is thin and tall like this, single layer of cells. In some parts, this epithelium dips down like this and then goes back up. So where it's dipping down, you can see it forms what is called glandular epithelium. This forms glands and they secrete by means of this duct. This area here is the duct. So from this you can see the functions of epithelium. So I've already said it secretes, so secretion is one function. Since it has this free surface, it can also absorb. In areas where it is thick, it is protective. So you'll find that the epithelium is protective in areas where it needs to be thick, where you need protection, forms glands. So, you know, additional secretion can be brought about. And in various parts, which we'll see, the epithelium is modified in some areas. And there you have special functions. We talked of some, remember, we talked of microvilli, we talked of cilia. We'll find parts where the epithelium has these cell modifications and there that's an added function of the epithelium there, okay? So let's stop here. So now I have a few questions to ask you now that we did epithelial tissue. Um, let's look at this question. So how do you think epithelium derives its nutrition since it's avascular. So this is one good point to remember about epithelium. It's avascular. But how does it get its nutrition? Okay, well, 60% got it right. Yes, it is through the underlying connective tissue. Nutrition is not through the air or through the luminal contents. It's through connective tissue. Remember, epithelium always rests on a basement membrane, and the basement membrane is secreted both by the epithelial cells and the connective tissue underneath. Connective tissue is very vascular, so that's why through connective tissue, through diffusion, you epithelium gets its nutrition. So remember we did diffusion, so now we are applying the concept of diffusion here, okay? Okay, another question, why do you think epithelium regenerates rapidly? Okay, <laughs> well, the correct answer, it is constantly abraded. So let's look at this. Um, it is when cell, the more specialized cells become, 
uh, specialization is at the cost of reproduction. You remember I told you nervous tissue, muscle tissue, highly specialized, don't regenerate as much, okay? So it's not because of specialization. It won't regenerate because it lacks a blood supply. Usually when things lack a blood supply, regeneration becomes a little poor. But here, because the blood supply is through diffusion and it's adequate enough, regeneration does occur. Uh, we'll see later, we do cartilage. Cartilage has a poor blood supply. Fibrous tissue has a poor blood supply. So they don't regenerate as well. So it's not because it lacks a blood supply, okay? Blood su lack of a blood supply is more of a hindrance, really. Uh, let's look at the last one. It has many layers. Not all epithelium has many layers. Look at squamous, which we, uh, which we will do. Single layered epithelium. So that's, layers has nothing to do with regeneration. Okay. The reason it regenerates is because, think of it, epithelium is present on the outside and it lines your cavities. So when it's present on the outside, such as the epidermis of the skin, this is constantly abraded, a lot of friction all the time. Similarly, as it's lining the, ca the cavities, for example, your nasal cavity, you know, you're breathing air with a lot of pollutants, with a lot of stuff that can kind of erode the epithelium. Um, and then, you know, when it goes down the trachea and down the larynx and trachea and so on, there also, think of your gastrointestinal tract. You're eating food of different temperatures, different textures. Again, the epithelium constantly abraded. So constant abrasion where it is kind of removed or almost sloughed off is the reason why epithelium regenerates really fast, okay? Yes. Okay, um, so the question was, if you didn't hear, was like epithelium when, you know, when burn or other cases where you kind of go right down to seeing bone, you do see regeneration, but there's a lot of scar tissue. And uh, why burn patients need grafting? That question I will answer in greater detail in the integumentary system because it's part of that. And the reason is that when you do the integumentary system and you will see that the epithelium, which is stratified there, it actually dips down. You know, your sweat glands and your hair follicles, they're really epithelial derivatives. So they really go down. And the deeper the burn, there are different grades of burns, which you don't have to do. But, you know, first degree is just removal of epidermis. So it'll grow back really fast because the basal layer is there. But if you go down to second degree and third degree burns, which are much deeper, then more tissue is removed and the extent of the burn is also important. So not only the depth, but if your greater area is removed, then the, the cells cannot migrate and close the gap. So that's why you have to do skin grafting. You're actually bridging the graft over there, uh, bridging the distance, sorry, between the two ends. Okay, so that's what happens. So here, let's look at classification of epithelium. This again is whenever there's a classification, you should al always know what are the methods you use for classification. So the first is that by number of layers. So if it is single layered, we call it simple epithelium. If it's multi-layered, we call it stratified epithelium. The word stratified comes from the word strata, which means layers. You know, when you were in school, in elementary school, you must have done the earth layers, the strata. I don't remember them in order, so I'm not even going to go there. But the different layers that there are on the earth, so strata is, is a word we use for layers. So stratified means multi-layered, okay? So based on the number of layers, single layer, the simple epithelium, many, more than one layer, we call it stratified. And then we have one which is in between, which is called pseudo-stratified. The word, word pseudo is not real. So this gives a false appearance of stratification. So the nuclei seem to be at different levels, but actually all cells reach the basement membrane. So that's why we say pseudo-stratified, not real stratification. <laughs> cells are not present truly one on top of the other, but just different heights gives it a false impression. 
So that's one way of classifying it. The second way is by the shape of the surface cells. So whatever is the shape of the top layer of cells, you name the epithelium accordingly. If the top layer of cells are flat, like this, really flat, where you can only see the nucleus. So it looks like, if you look at it from the top, it looks like a fried egg. You know where in a fried egg, if you look at it from the top, you can only see the yolk. And if you take a side view, this is what it will look like, right? The yolk is in the center. So very thin. So this is squamous epithelium. The second is cuboidal, where the epithelium is like a cube, where the cells are like a cube. So the cells are as tall as they are broad. And usually you see very little cytoplasm on the top. You see more on the sides. Columnar, like a column. So the cells are taller than they are broader. So they're taller than they are broader like this. So the nucleus could be round or the nucleus could be rod shaped. And we'll see these different epithelia. So based on the top layer of cells, you may have many layers where the bottom layers could be cuboidal or columnar. But if the top layer is squamous, since it's many layered, we will say it is stratified. And the top layer is squamous, we'll say stratified squamous. Got that? So if it is, for example, you have a single layer and it is cuboidal, we'll just say simple cuboidal epithelium or simple columnar epithelium or pseudo-stratified epithelium because it's pseudo-stratified. Suppose we have a layer where the top layer is, is uh, columnar and there are many layers, we'll call it stratified columnar. Okay, so you see how you're using both. Then we have another special type of epithelium which is called transitional, which is stratified, so it's multi-layered, but the top layer of cells don't have any of these three shapes. They are very different. The top layer of cells is kind of they're very round, juicy looking with a little peg like this. So it's in a class by its own. So it is stratified, but the top layer, we can't say cuboidal, squamous, or um, columnar. Okay, so we call it separate. It's called transitional epithelium. It's only seen in the urinary tract. So a good name for it is actually urothelium because it's only in the urinary tract. Which one are you talking about? The transitional. Urothelium, urothelium. We'll go over that. that. This was just a general introduction. So let's now look at simple squamous epithelium. So remember, epithelium always rests on a basement membrane, and under the basement membrane is connective tissue, which you can see here. Here is a blood vessel. So notice a blood vessel here, and that's how through diffusion the nutrients will go to the cells. As you can see, very, very thin cells. The, if you look here, if on a cross section, you can see that this, only the nucleus can be seen. You can barely see the cytoplasm. And this, again, you can see in this area, see here, you can see the nuclei really well, barely see the cytoplasm. You can just see the basement membrane and the nuclei. So flattened cells with very little cytoplasm. And here are some pictures, actual histological pictures. This is a blood vessel here. And here is the lining of the blood vessel, which in, what is the lining of a blood vessel called? The special name for it is endothelium. So here the arrow is pointing to the squamous cell nuclei. Can you see this very, very thin layer? Here again, you're looking here at the, right here on the, on this periphery, you're looking at squamous epithelium. This is seen in the kidney glomerulus. So I won't go over all the areas that you will find it. Those are there in your notes. But here you can see lining a blood vessel, the kidney glomerulus, mesothelium where it lines the serous membranes. It's seen in the alveoli, the air sacs of the lungs. These are a few areas where you see it. Why is it also called the Bowman's capsule? Actually, the glomerulus is truly this part, which also has squamous epithelium. It has an outer covering which is called the Bowman's capsule. So this outer part is truly the Bowman's capsule, but we kind of loosely call it glomerulus here. When we do the urinary system, we kind of divide it into two parts. Okay. Now, this is one way to think of, so always think of why is this epithelial, what would be the function instead of just memorizing it. 
So where would you primarily expect to find squamous epithelium? Yeah, where would you find squamous epithelium? And use it to your, what happens every day. Squamous epithelium, like I said, thin, flattened cells. It's like having a thin wall. So if you were to build a house, where would you put thin walls? Something like that. I mean, you know, think of it that way. Okay, the correct answer is three, number three, where diffusion is needed. When you want protection, you want something thick. You don't want something really thin. Can you see how flimsy this is going to be? So stratified epithelium, which has many layers, is a thick epithelium. That's going to be there where you want protection. Secretion, remember secretion comes from cytoplasm. We did the cell. The cell has those cell organelles, Golgi bodies, which secrete, you know, areas which secrete a lot, have a lot of Golgi bodies and they secrete proteins. You have a lot of uh, endoplasmic, rough endoplasmic reticulum as well. Here you have very little cytoplasm. So with the result, there's going to be not too many Golgi bodies or too much rough endoplasmic reticulum. So copious secretion is not possible. It's not going to be able to produce lots of secretion. Cells which have more cytoplasm, like a columnar cell, will be able to secrete a lot more because there's a lot more cytoplasm, okay? And areas that need support, again, thin, flimsy. So it's not going to be very supportive. So that, again, is not one of its function. Its function is where you need diffusion. And think of the areas. I said alveoli of the lungs. Gases diffuse across the alveolar wall. Carbon dioxide goes into the alveolus. You breathe it out. Oxygen goes through the alveolus into the capillaries. Capillaries also have thin epithelium, this endothelium, right? So that's where it is, where diffusion is needed. So that's the function of it. In the filtration, uh, in the kidney glomerulus, that's the area where filtration occurs. Remember, filtration is, is diffusion, but pressure, based on pressure, not on concentration. So again, can you see that? When you need it to be thin-walled so that it can pass through real easily. It's like a cheesecloth, Okay. So you can pour things down, comes out easily. Where is the renal cortex located? That's in the top of the kidney. Okay. Let's look at the next um, cell, uh, cell, next type of epithelium, which is cuboidal. As I told you, these cells are as tall as they are broad. They are like a cube. So you see cytoplasm on the sides, but usually very little cytoplasm on the top. So can you see here? Looks like a necklace of beads and here again look at these cells you know not as tall as they are broad not too much cytoplasm on top you can see that little bit but not too much here again you can see these so you can see the nuclei really well and look at this cytoplasm on the sides but very little on the top so these again are not because the, there's not too much cytoplasm these won't be able to secrete as much but since, since they are not as flimsy as, a, as squamous epithelium, you usually find these in small ducts. You find it in glands like the thyroid gland, the epithelium covering the ovary, you know, other areas which I've given you. And the reason why it helps is because it's got some height to it. So there's some thickness to it. So it kind of helps, it acts a little bit like a support. It helps to keep the tube open because it's present in ducts and glands. So it keeps the tube open or what is known as patent. Patent means to keep it open. So it keeps all the ducts open. It doesn't allow them to collapse. So that's where you'll see cuboidal epithelium. Here we have columnar epithelium. Now here you look, the cells are taller than they are broader. So they are like columns. So look at this, real tall. Look at the nucleus is rounded here. In some cases, the nucleus may be rod shaped. But you can see so much cytoplasm on the top, <coughs> just above the nucleus. So these cells have a lot of cytoplasm, so they're usually secretory. Whenever you need secretion, you don't want too many layers because the secretion from the bottom would have to travel through all those layers, right? So you want simple epithelium, so it's easy to secrete. 
so it can pour out its secretions real easily it doesn't have to go through its number of layers and it has this cytoplasm when we did cells remember we talked of microvilli where which was the the cell surface it kind of got folded in like this right that was called which increased the surface area so in many parts where you have columnar epithelium you tend to find these microvilli which increase the surface area they increase the surface area both for secretion and it also helps to absorb so secretion and absorption so that's why these cells with columnar epithelium is found in the gastrointestinal tract many parts of the gastrointestinal tract have simple columnar epithelium and the microvilli when you look at it under the microscope it gives this appearance you can't see the microvilli like this it kind of gives this little brush like appearance and i think i may have mentioned it when we were doing the cell so this is known as a brush border so can you look at the top it this area looks like a a little bit like a brush so the microvilli is known as brush border both secretion and absorption the whole cell plus this mic having microvilli helps it even further because it's increasing the surface area so the simple columnar cell is the not the yellow the simple columnar cell is are these i'm coming to the yellow cells okay. very often in simple columnar cells interspersed between the cells you will find single cells which are also columnar but these are single celled glands these are known as goblet cells so goblet cells are single celled glands they secrete mucus they're called goblet cells because they look like a goblet look somewhat like a goblet they secrete mucus which is very thick histologically when we process the tissue and we use alcohol to process the tissue alcohol removes mucus so the cells actually tend to look rather empty or frothy so you can see here these are what goblet cells look like you can see the mucus in the goblet cells looks frothy or empty looking because the mucus has been removed mucus helps it's helpful you find goblet cells in the respiratory tract you will find it in parts of the fallopian tube also mucus is very thick the reason you find it in the respiratory tract is because you want you know you are breathing all kinds of particulate matter so it will kind of trap the particulate matter and make sure that it doesn't go down into your lungs you also find goblet cells mucus is alkaline in nature you find goblet cells in the gi tract also so in the gi tract in some parts of the gastrointestinal tract you have columnar epithelium with goblet cells because you want to neutralize the acid which is coming from the stomach so in the small intestine you'll find this kind of epithelium with goblet cells to helps to neutralize the acid so the medium becomes alkaline very soon okay so that's the function of the mucus and the goblet cells this is an example where so there we saw microvilli in that previous slide this is simple columnar epithelium here which has neither microvilli nor cilia so it's just simple columnar so you know tall column like cells taller than they are broader and in some areas we might have columnar cells which actually have cilia if you remember cilia were very different from microvilli microvilli were like this cilia were this right they were hair like processes cilia is seen in areas where you need a wave like motion to be produced so that you know things are kind of pushed along so you see ciliated epithelium in the respiratory tract so you'll see cilia in the respiratory tract though the epithelium is not simple columnar but i'll show you the epithelium there but you see cilia there and in the fallopian tube 
In the fallopian tube, this is very, very typical, seeing simple columnar epithelium with cilia. Yes. So the cilia rest, rest on top of the microvilli? No, no. Cilia and microvilli are totally different. So microvilli are just surface invaginations like this. Okay? When you have cilia, you don't have microvilli then. Cilia are hair-like processes that project out of the cell. So I was just comparing the two here. Okay, so here, if you look here, these are the cilia. They are on top of the cell. This is the top of the cell. Here is cilia. And you look at the previous one. See here, this is the top of the cell. This part here. So the microvilli are actually going in like this. So can you see here? The microvilli are going in. And that's what gives that brush border, this part. I can see it in that. I don't see it in the it's like a border on the top oh, okay. here, here, this, this, this part here, just this border, this, just this area. Okay. If you want to, I have brought a book with really great pictures. So just this area, just this area is the area of the microvilli, okay? Thank you. Yeah. And just this area is the area of the cilia. This part. Yes. It doesn't, it, yes, it could have a columnar epithelium, could be just simple columnar epithelium. It could be simple columnar with cilia. So we call it ciliated columnar. Or it could be simple columnar where you see microvilli, where you call, we say columnar with brush border. Okay? What's the purpose of the, columnar, the simple columnar cells in the fallopian tube? Well, fallopian tube with, with cilia. Fallopian tube, you, you need to push the the egg from the o it picks up the egg from the ovary and pushes it towards the uterus. So you need to set up currents of fluid. So that's why you have columnar cells and they secrete the fluid. And the cilia help to beat the, the fluid, make fluid currents and push the ovum along. Okay? Now let's look at the next one, which is between stratified and simple. And this is pseudo stratified. So in pseudostratified, if you look right here, can you see that all the nuclei are at different levels? So it gives an idea of, it looks like it is stratified, many layered. But if you look at the picture when we draw it, either here or here, all the cells touch the basement membrane. So if you notice, all the cells touch the basement membrane. They're just of different heights. So with the result, the nuclei are present at different heights. So that's why we call it pseudo-stratified. It's not true stratified. In, in stratified epithelium, one layer has to sit on top of the other. So you have to have one layer sitting on top of the other. So in this, they all touch the basement membrane, but the nuclei are at different levels because some are tall, some are small. So that's why it's called pseudo-stratified. Most of the cells are columnar, so that's why we usually call it pseudostratified columnar epithelium. This kind of epithelium, when it has cilia, then we add pseudostratified ciliated columnar. So if it has cilia, we'll say pseudostratified ciliated columnar. In other words, you're just trying to give more information about the kind of epithelium there is. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar is present in the respiratory tract, so right from your nasal cavity down to large bronchioles. Just plain pseudostratified columnar without the cilia, you might see in patches in the reproductive tract. And the same pseudostratified columnar might have goblet cells, especially in the respiratory tract. So you can see here you have goblet cells, and I gave you the function there because you want to trap particulate matter. Where is the pseudostratified yeah. ciliated? What, what was that down there? Respiratory tract. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar is in the respiratory tract. Just Plain pseudostratified columnar without the cilia, you see patchily in areas of the reproductive tract. 
Now we go to actual stratified epithelium where it is layered. So it could be two layers, it could be more than two layers. But the moment you have two or more, you immediately call it stratified. You give the second part, stratified whatever, that second part of the epithelium is based on what the top layer of cells looks like. It doesn't matter what the bottom layer is like. Whatever the top layer is, that's what you'll call it. So if the top layer is cuboidal, you will say stratified cuboidal. If the top layer is columnar, you'll say stratified columnar. If the top layer is squamous, you will say stratified squamous. So that stratified is the first one because it's many layered. And then the next part of the epithelial name is based on what the top layer is. Okay. So here we call it stratified cuboidal. So you can see two layers. Usually stratified cuboidal is made up of two, maybe three, most of the time two layers. The bottom layer could be cuboidal or columnar. It doesn't matter. The top layer is cuboidal. And here you can see the two layers. So you'll see nuclei at two levels. Can you see this? Nuclei at two levels, right? So tell you that this is two layered, okay? Stratified cuboidal is often seen in large ducts, very often seen in very large ducts. Again, that gives strength and support to the ducts and also maintains the patency or keeps it open. Compare this to the next one which is stratified columnar. Now stratified columnar could be so many layers or it could be just two layers where the lower layer could be, the bottom layer could be cuboidal or columnar, but the top layer is definitely columnar. Can you see this? The top layer is definitely columnar. The bottom layer could be cuboidal or columnar, it doesn't matter. Rarely do you see so many layers. Most of the time you see only two or maximum three layers. It's a very rare kind of epithelium. You don't see it continuously in any area. Again, seen in large ducts, there may be patches of it. So part of the duct may be stratified cuboidal and somewhere else maybe a little friction or something. It becomes stratified columnar. Okay, So not all that easy to see. Uh, fine, sometimes you do. But here you can see again two layers of nuclei. Can you see that? And the top layer is columnar because you see a lot more cytoplasm on the top. Okay? So this is stratified columnar. The, yeah. the apical surface just simply means the top layer? A apical surface means the top layer, the one that is facing the lumen or the outside. <laughs> this is transitional epithelium, the one I was telling you, which is stratified. But the top layer we can't call squamous or cuboidal or columnar. So it has many layers. The bottom layer is usually cuboidal to columnar cells. Then we have a few layers where the cells look piriform. Piriform means pear-shaped. So here, if you look, these are the piriform cells. So you have about two or three layers of these. And you can see in between the cells, you notice these spaces which are present. These are important. So you'll see a lot of spaces between these cells. And the topmost layer of the cells, they're very, very large, as you can see. Can you see these apical cells are very, very large? They're actually given a special name. They're known as umbrella cells. Because if you look at the cell, it really looks like this. It looks like a little umbrella. And here's the nucleus. This is, okay? And, one minute. And the reason why you have these spaces is that this, this kind of epithelium is capable of stretch. So when it's in a relaxed state, the layers are many. When it is stretched, it's present in the entire urinary tract, meaning from the ureter down to the urinary bladder. So when the bladder fills up with urine and the bladder stretches, what happens is that these, this cell will drop into this space. So this cell will come down. This will come down. This will then drop into this space. So the number of layers kind of decreases. It looks like it's decreased and that's, so it becomes thinner and that helps it to stretch. Okay? And the other special feature of this um, transitional epithelium is that the topmost layer of cells, they actually secrete a substance. 
they secrete a substance which kind of lines them like this. This layer is called the cuticle. And this does not allow water to pass through because this is lining the urinary bladder. So imagine this is the urinary bladder and here's your epithelium. This is the topmost layer and here are all the bottom cells. And here is the cuticle. So the bladder is filled with urine which is fluid. It does not allow the fluid to pass through here and get into the cells. So this cuticle is impervious <clears throat> to urine. Impervious means it doesn't allow urine to pass through and get into the walls. So two functions. It is stretchable and it's impervious to urine which makes it the ideal kind of epithelium to be in the urinary tract. You had a question? The umbrella cells are only on the top, yes. Then they're called umbrella cells on the top. Very fat, plump, juicy cells. Okay. And everywhere notice that there is a basement membrane on which these cells sit and the apical surface is the free surface. Can you show me where the basement membrane is? This, here is the basement. Over here, here is the basement membrane where the cells begin from. This one here. Here is where the basement membrane is. Here. Let me go back to another slide. This is the basement membrane. In between the connective tissue. Yes. This is the basement membrane. Previous slide. This is the basement membrane. You can never, you know, it's easier to draw the basement membrane than to actually, you will not see a, 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 a very nice line. But you, yes, but you can always tell because you can see that the nuclei begin from there. There is a very definite arrangement from there onwards. In the, Transitional epithelium, actually, the basement membrane is even more ill-defined than in other, other epithelia. Now we come to the stratified squamous epithelium where it's multi-layered, many, many layers. And there are two types here. You have a type where, which is known as wet epithelium. Wet because it is moist and the top layer of cells still have nuclei in them. The top layer is squamous but you still see nuclei in the top layer of cells. Nuclei seen in top layer. The second is called dry epithelium which is also known as keratinized so this one would be called non-keratinized. And if you look at this picture here, you can see that there are no nuclei seen here in this top layer because keratin consists of dead cells. So the cells have now died and they've lost their nuclei. So no nuclei in the topmost. It's all just pink homogenous, meaning all like one clump. These cells have nuclei here, but then these are the top layer. They're actually made up of cells like this, which have lost their nuclei. And these are dead cells. And this type of epithelium, the dry keratinized epithelium, is what is present on your skin, in the epidermis of skin. So when you scratch your skin and the flakes that come off, that is this keratin which is being shed, this dry top layer of dead cells which is flowing, which is coming off. So dry carrot or dry epithelium or stratified squamous keratinized, which is this one, is seen, it's exam keratinized, is seen in the epidermis of skin. So here you can see, you can see nuclei till here. And then after that, can you see all of this is just pink? Because here the cells are, if you had a little higher power, this is what you will see. This is how the cells look, but no nuclei, because they're all dead cells. Compare that to this one, which is the wet epithelium, or known as non-keratinized, where you can see nuclei right till the top. So you can see these cells, they're all living right till the top. 
this kind of epithelium is seen in the oral cavity in the mouth, wherever a lot of abrasion is there oral cavity pharynx you see it in the anal canal the vagina all these areas so multi layered you see so many layers so just you know you can't even count the layers so it is very very thick epithelium compared to whatever we've seen so far so what do you think would be the function of this kind of epithelium Very good, yes, protection, thicker the epithelium, having a thick wall. And I gave you these um, examples. Another example is esophagus. So, you know, oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus. You know, again, you put all kinds of food, different temperature in your mouth, passes down into your esophagus, needs uh, protection. Uh, anal canal, again, you know, the feces can be of different texture again. So, again, you need that. Uh, secretion is not one of its prime functions, neither is absorption. So it's multi-layered, it's difficult to absorb from so many layers, though epidermis of the skin does have some absorptive capabilities. And movement of substances such as mucus, that's the function of cilia. The epithelium itself will not move the substance. Yes, call it. That applies to both wet and dry. In the dry, the protection is even more, you know, because it's exposed to the environment as much. Yes. Give me an example of a dry example. Of what one? Of the dry one. The dry epidermis of skin. Yeah, that's the only example we have for the dry uh, keratinized epithelium is the epidermis of skin. Okay. Let's look at glands. Glands are really epithelial derivatives. And when I'm talking about the glands which are epithelial derivatives, those are what we call exocrine glands. So exocrine glands secrete, they have their secretions and they pour it by means of ducts. So exocrine glands are also called glands with ducts. So here you can see different ways that a gland can be formed. This is the surface epithelium. This blue line is the epithelium. And let's say in one part, and I'm taking a part of the small intestine, so this epithelium dips in like this and forms a small short gland. So the lower part of the gland is the one which will secrete. And then, you know, you've got a small area which does not secrete but just transports whatever is being secreted to the lumen. So this will be called the duct. Here you have a gland where the epithelium went in but decided, you know, I'm going to do a little bit more work. I'm going to make it look, look a little prettier. So it's got three kind of little prongs to it. And these are all the ducts that you see. Here's one which has got a different shape. So you can see how the epithelium can kind of go in and, you know, how it can form. And whenever we take a cut section, whether we take a cut section here or we take a cut section of this, this is how we'll see it. We'll see a cut section and we'll see the epithelium, which could be cuboidal or columnar, depending on where it arose. Usually, the epithelium of the duct is cuboidal because you don't want this to be too tall because if it is very tall, then it will close off the lumen, right? And you won't be able to pour your secretions, okay? So that's how a gland is formed. These exocrine glands, they pour their secretions. You know, remember we did exocytosis, right? Most of them pour their secretions by means of exocytosis. So you can see the Golgi rough endoplasmic reticulum forms the secretions which are usually proteinaceous in nature, transfers it to the Golgi complex and by exocytosis it pours it out. This kind of 
the way this is secreted is known as merocrine secretion. So most exocrine glands in your body pour secretions by the way of merocrine secretion. There's another type which nowadays they don't believe is seen in humans where the, the secretions are made and poured into vesicles and then the top part of the cell is kind of pinched off pinched off. The apical part of the cell is pinched off and that's known as apocrine secretion. Apocrine meaning apical part pinched off. They believe that this is not seen so much in us. It is seen in animals. At one point they used to think that some of the uh, glands in your, uh, the sweat glands in the armpits, the axilla, you had an apocrine kind of secretion but not anymore. But this is anyway one way of secretion. And a third type way one secretion can occur is where the cell, actually the entire cell ruptures and pours all its secretions out. So it kind of just bursts. And that's known as holocrine secretion. And then the bottom cells, they undergo mitosis and regenerate. So you keep making new cells and then the tops, the cells will just rupture and pour all these secretions. This kind of secretion is seen and when we do the integumentary system, we'll see it. This is seen in sebaceous glands. These are present in skin, sebaceous glands. So this was the exocrine glands. Endocrine glands are what are called ductless glands. So endocrine glands do not have ducts. They are ductless glands. They may have been connected to the epithelium at one time and lost their connection. So, you know, an epithelium may have, may have dipped in, formed this gland, and at a certain point it closed off and then this became the gland. So it doesn't have a duct, can you see? So what it does is it pours its secretions directly into a blood vessel. So it's called endocrine, and what is poured into the blood vessel are hormones. And then these hormones will go and act on distant targets. Some endocrine glands don't necessarily have to start from the epithelium like this. That means they start as an invagination and lose their connection. They can start from mesoderms. You have some glands which begin like that. The thyroid is one example. So the uh, uh, m many of them, the adrenal has a little bit different. The, the thyroid is one example. Parathyroid is another so these glands start from mesoderm and then they go and form glands. So they don't start from the epithelium. So in any case, whether, whatever they ori their origin is from, they do not have any ducts. They pour their secretions directly into the bloodstream and their secretions are hormones. And that's how the endocrine system, remember what does endocrine, what is the function of the endocrine system? To produce hormones and pour them into the blood circulation so that they can act on distant target organs. Right? Exocrine glands, on the other hand, will always be connected to the epithelium and they will pour their secretions into the lumen, right? Because they are arising from the epithelium, so they always have their connection to the epithelium. Let's look at the next type of tissue now. So we're done with epithelium. So that is the topmost layer whenever you're looking at any organ. An organ is made up of tissues of different types. So epithelium could be one of the tissues which, it, which is lining the organ. Then we have connective tissue, which is the predominant tissue in the body. It has three main constituents. In order to be called connective tissue, you have to have cells. You have to have fibers and you have to have ground substance. The fibers and ground substance are secreted by the cells. And together, the fibers and ground substance are known as matrix. Okay, so it has cells and matrix. What is matrix made of? Fibers and ground substance. So that's why I said you have cells, fibers and ground substance. The 
cells are always like any normal cell in the body the matrix its consistency could be liquid fluid like plasma plasma is the ground substance of blood blood is a type of connective tissue or it could be jelly like uh, you know when you see when you'll see connective tissue um, for example adipose tissue is a little jelly like even cartilage to a certain extent is kind of jelly like or it could be really hard like bone bone is very very hard right so you can see how can it from fluid it can go all the way to being really hard connective tissue does not occur on a free surface like epithelium occurs on a free surface connective tissue doesn't it's always below the epithelium or it forms packing material you know in between stuff so it's not on the free surface <coughs> very good vascular and nervous supply some areas like cartilage and tendons and ligaments tendons and even ligaments these don't have a good blood supply so with the result they don't heal as well if they are torn they don't heal that well so let's look at some of the cells and some of the fibers of connective tissue the ground substance is the the material or the substance in which the cells and the fibers are kind of embedded in it okay so to give you an example for example blood when we do blood we'll see blood is called a uh, connective tissue but it's an atypical type of connective tissue because the cells in blood are red blood cells white blood cells and platelets and we'll do that so you don't need to write it down we'll be doing blood separately so you are you are you know they are floating in plasma which is the ground substance the fibers are fibrinogen you know when your blood clots and you form the, these little threads that fibrin threads so those are the fibers of blood so you can see how they are dispersed in that so ground substance is all this this part here which could be liquid to really solid but let's look at the types of fibers that you could see in connective tissue you could see fibers which are very thin usually occur singly that means they are single maybe branched can you see these branching going on here you can see another branch here this is known as elastic fiber so sometimes when elastic fiber is cut you might see it recoil it's like a rubber band you know it's thin and elastic you might see the end curled up like this because it's elastic so the elasticity you know it kind of gets torn at that part and that's how it curls up so that's one type of fiber you see then you might find fibers which are very extremely thin even thinner than elastic fibers they kind of form little networks these are known as reticular fibers so you can see that here very very thin reticular fibers reticular fibers are usually seen in lymphatic tissue they are very helpful in forming a framework and then another type of fiber we see which is more predominant are these collagen fibers these collagen fibers which are the ones in blue and just by looking at it can you see they tend to run in bundles they don't individually branch but a bundle might branch so an individual fiber won't branch but you know bundles running together some will run in one direction and another set of fibers will run in another direction so bundles might branch they have great tensile strength so very very strong these collagen fibers so these are the main types of fibers that you see let's look at cells all of connective tissue actually comes from primitive stem cells which are known as mesenchymal cells these are the primitive stem cells and in your body your mesenchyme is the one which kind of goes and gives rise to all the different types of connective tissue you know cartilage or bone or blood or adipose tissue or you know the different types so once mesenchymal cells have matured they form different types of cells so let's look at some different cells first one are these the adipocytes which are fat cells 
so they they are round filled with fat the nucleus is always pushed to the periphery because of this fat globule so the cells tend to look empty you know just like that goblet cell they look empty because when we process the tissue the fat is removed then we might find cells which are phagocytic these are macrophages so they're very large you know with a lot of cytoplasmic extensions so these are phagocytic in nature then we'll see a few blood cells such as eosinophils we'll might see some plasma cells neutrophils these are blood cells when we do blood cells we'll talk about them in connective tissue it's not uncommon to find mast cells these mast cells have these granules can you see these granules present inside these granules liberate histamine and heparin and you often find a lot of mast cells in whenever there's an allergic response a lot of mast cells are seen in that area because histamine and heparin is is secreted and that causes your blood vessels to dilate and fluid goes out that's why whenever you have an allergy you take something called antihistaminic to prevent that histamine release <laughs> and then the main cell of the connective tissue is this fibroblast this big cell up here which you can see it's kind of star shaped this is the one which actually gives rise to all the fibers so is this fibroblast so this is the main cell this green cell the main cell of connective tissue Now just as we did epithelia let's look at some connective tissue types embryonic connective tissue or in the embryo obviously it is present everywhere in us when we are born not seen in many areas in the pulp of your tooth you know little remnants might be there in the umbilical cord and then of course that cord falls off so for us right it's not all that important but it's this embryonic connective tissue which can form any kind of other connective tissue and then when we look at the adult connective tissue or after the child is born these are the main types you have connective tissue which is very loose not dense and closely packed in contrast to that you have dense connective tissue and dense connective tissue can be regularly arranged so we call it dense regular or we call it dense irregular where it's dense but it's in a haphazard fashion so it's dense regular connective tissue or dense irregular we'll see look at be looking at them and then of course we have cartilage bone and blood so these are the different types of connective tissue let's examine loose connective tissue so it's loose so there is a lot of ground substance the fibers are not closely packed together so you see a lot of ground substance in between the fibers so one example is loose areolar tissue loose areolar tissue if you've ever gone to the grocery store and you've bought a steak and you know you you know the marbling the fat that is there present in between but sometimes when you even when you're separating it or even you know when you're cleaning chicken and so on and you get this little slimy uh, kind of whitish stuff that you wash off that is the loose areola tissue that you're you're talking about and even in when you separate you know muscle pieces in between you kind of get a looseish tissue that is loose areola tissue so the real thin it's it's thin and slimy kind of you know it's it's got a little fluid in it okay loose areolar tissue so you can see these are collagen bundles with fibroblasts you may have lymphocyte mast cells elastic fibers and all these spaces contain fluid because that's where the ground substance is another loose connective tissue is adipose tissue or fat tissue where these cells are 
the cells are closely packed, but the tissue itself is quite loose. It can kind of be compressed or spread. Each cell is filled with a lot of fat globules. So because there is fat inside, it tends to push the nucleus towards the periphery. So there's very little cytoplasm because most of the cell is taken up by the fat. Very, very little cytoplasm or matrix. And as I said, when you look at it under the microscope, they often look empty. It gives a very typical chicken wire appearance. You know, often the cells are kind of, because they're packed close together, they're kind of pushed against each other, so they, it looks like this, exactly like I've drawn. You may not even see the nucleus because it might be just pushed <laughs> on the periphery like this. Adipose tissue is seen under your skin, under the dermis, where it's subcutaneous tissue. It's protective, so it's often seen around organs, acting as a protective coat around organs. It also see, is seen where blood vessels are, so blood vessels often lie in fat. Again, it protects them. Areolar tissue is kind of found everywhere in the body. There's not one area that you can say you don't find areolar tissue. It's just extremely widespread. And here are some pictures of that. So here you can see areolar tissue. So look at these collagen bundles. The single ones, dark ones, are elastic fibers. These dots are probably nuclei of fibroblasts because fibroblasts are most numerous. So here you can see fat cells. So can you see very chicken wire-like appearance? You know, the nucleus is just pushed to the periphery. Very, very thin nucleus. You can barely make that out. And another type of loose connective tissue is reticular tissue, where, again, if you remember, I told you reticular fibers are very thin. So they form the framework for lymphoid tissue. So reticular type of connective tissue is seen in all lymphatic tissue. You have to use a special stain to stain this reticular tissue. Now, what do you think would be the function of loose connective tissue? And especially areola, but any of the loose connective tissue. Yes, very good. It provides a packing, it provides packing material. It's loose, so you can push it anywhere. So just pack the areas where there are spaces. So it provides packing material. Not very strong. Strength is where the fibers are densely arranged. So dense connective tissue is more strong than loose connective tissue. Which brings us to dense connective tissue. And if you remember, I said there were two types. There was dense regular and dense irregular. In dense regular, all the col most of the time it's all collagen fibers. These collagen fibers are arranged in a very regular pattern. So there's some regularity to it. So you can see they're all arranged in this kind of horizontal manner. And in between the fibers you can see these are fibroblast nuclei. So here you have the fibroblast nuclei. So this is dense regular. So very, very orderly arrangement of the fibers. They could be this way. They could be linear going down this way. So this is seen, dense regular kind of connective tissue is seen in tendons and ligaments. Since they are arranged in one direction, they withstand stress or tensile forces in one direction. So any tensile force which is applied in this direction, these, these fibers are able to kind of withstand that. So they withstand tensile forces in one direction or stress in one direction. Compare this to dense irregular connective tissue, which is this one, where the fibers are densely arranged, 
but here they are some are arranged in this longitudinal fashion some are arranged in another fashion so when you make cut sections you can see some cut longitudinally some cut transversely which you can see here cut in different ways so these can withstand strength or uh, withstand stress in different directions because all the fibers are present in different directions these are often seen in capsules of joints surrounding capsules of joints in the dermis of the skin this is an example of dermis of the skin where you have to withstand forces in different directions so dense irregular is seen in such areas so again you must know the function and you must know where it is found okay where is the uh, regular tendons and ligaments capsules of joints in the dermis of the skin submucosa of the gastrointestinal tract you see it all in these areas what is aponeurosis aponeurosis is a flattened tendon aponeurosis is so it's it's again it also is seen dense regular aponeurosis is a flattened tendon I think it's there in your notes. Aponeurosis. That was dense regular. Aponeurosis is nothing but a flattened tendon in your anterior abdominal wall. All your oblique muscles become aponeurotic in the middle, so that it's con. it becomes fibrous and gives you strength you don't want muscle to be fleshy right in the front because you have no bone there so you you could get hurt easily so you want something strong and that's in the abdomen mm -hmm. the next connective tissue is cartilage three types of cartilage you must know where they are found what is the difference between them so hyaline cartilage is found the fetal skeleton is composed mainly of hyaline cartilage it's found in the nose in the larynx trachea costal cartilages at the ends of long bones so if you have a long bone so let's say we have the humerus here at the end of the humerus on the upper aspect of the humerus you have this hyaline cartilage here present where this humerus is going to form the shoulder joint this kind of hyaline cartilage is known as articular cartilage articular to tell you that it's going to form a joint or articulate with another bone Now again like any connective tissue you have ground substance which is all of this area cells the cells of cartilage are known as chondrocytes chondra means cartilage so the cells of cartilage are called chondrocytes and they have collagen fibers or elastic fibers Now if you look at this picture of hyaline cartilage you'll see some words one is cell nests and cartilage also has something known as perichondrium so the cartilage is surrounded by a layer on its outside which is known as perichondrium the word chondra means cartilage peri means around this perichondrium actually is the area which provides blood supply to the cartilage cartilage remember we did earlier is a it does not have a very good blood supply it's not totally avascular but the blood supply comes from the perichondrium do all three i'll come i'll come to that one minute just hold on so let's look at hyaline cartilage so it has this perichondrium the cells which are chondrocytes 
they are arranged in a odd fashion they may uh, sit singly they may be together like two they may be three of them or they may be four cells put together you know they're sitting together and they all sit in a little space which is known as a lacuna so the lacuna is a space in which these chondrocytes are sitting so the chondrocytes are the cells which sit in this lacuna so when the cells are more are two or more together we call them cell nests or another name if you read it's also known as isogenous groups cell nests are just the chondrocytes which are together in two or <coughs> two to four chondrocytes when they sit together in a lacuna we, they form a little nest so it's like eggs in a nest so we call it cell nest another name for these cell nests is isogenous groups in hyaline cartilage you can see these cell nests very clearly as seen in this picture you can see this ground substance but you cannot see the fibers separately because the ground substance and the fibers have the same refractive index so you cannot see them under the microscope you cannot see them separately they are there you just cannot see them so that's one distinguishing feature of it compare this to elastic cartilage where again you have this perichondrium on the outside you have cell nests but now you can actually see the elastic fibers and notice here are these elastic fibers which are present so you see these elastic fibers and they run perpendicular to the axis along which the cartilage has been cut so you know this is the length of the cartilage look at them they are running perpendicular this way i want you guys to find out where you would find elastic cartilage so next when we see on meet i uh, meet you on wednesday i'm going to ask you so you should know where do you find elastic cartilage obviously it has a lot of elastic fiber so it is very flexible the third type of cartilage is fibro cartilage fibro meaning lot of fibrous tissue lot of collagen fibers so collagen fibers are a lot more than there are cells so you see many collagen fibers running in different directions in between them trapped are these chondrocytes but they are much fewer than the fibers you don't see cell nests as much and there is no perichondrium in fibrocartilage so fibrocartilage lacks a perichondrium another type of cartilage which lacks a perichondrium if you remember i told you that articular cartilage that hyaline cartilage which was present on the surface of long bones where they formed a joint this also does not have a perichondrium so whenever you get things like this exceptions to the rule always kind of make a note of it so two places where you don't have perichondrium is articular cartilage which is hyaline and fibro cartilage you don't have perichondrium okay no this is this is not articular cartilage this is just showing you simple hyaline cartilage because it's not hyaline cartilage no i said no perichondrium only in the articular only in the artic in all of hyaline cartilage you will see perichondrium oh. only in the articular part of hyaline you won't see perichondrium in the fibro cartilage you will not see perichondrium hi it's an example of hyaline right and these this these are the three pictures which show you so this is hyaline cartilage look at the cell nests this is the ground substance this area is the lacuna in which you see the cells but no fibers look at elastic cartilage this part here is the perichondrium in in this hyaline you're not seeing perichondrium so here is the perichondrium look at the elastic fibers going in a perpendicular fashion cells cell nests <coughs> This is fibro cartilage. Can you see how sparse the cells are? More fibers, less cells. It's been taken from the center so you can't really tell but it doesn't have any perichondrium. Okay? So these are the three different types. I want you to find out where do you find elastic cartilage? Where do you find out where do you find uh, fibro cartilage? 
and what is the function of fibrocartilage?